kept going down this road of what's what drives people to innovate and took me into this world of creativity and this was fiddling in my brain about outdoors and walking and what does that do i naturally ended up at this research place with all these papers on my desk of this stuff which eventually ended up in the book Gary Pratt is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Gary is the co-founder of EarSwitch, an innovative sensor technology startup. He was previously entrepreneur in residence and a teaching fellow in the entrepreneurship at the University of Bath where he ran an accelerator program that supported high-tech, high-growth digital startups in the areas such as media tech, VR, VR, and AI. Gary has held senior positions in the pre-dot-com tech world across the U.S. and Europe and is the co-founder of Teach It, a leading educational digital content provider. The Creativity Factor, his book, which I'm holding up right now here, offers scientific and practical evidence for the entrepreneurial creativity with advice on the mechanism, habits, and techniques that develop the skills. This unique holistic guide will provide you with a newfound awareness of your creative potential and how it can lead to business success. And... For all those in the United States listening to this podcast, January 24th is the U.S. book launch. So it's a global book, and it's exciting that a lot of people will have access to it now. It's important in these times since COVID and Brexit and all the things going on in the world in the publishing industry to have multiple publishers and distributors around the world because with new laws and regulations, especially in the EU, it's been difficult to get books. But I'd like to welcome... Gary to the podcast and thank you for being here Gary. Thanks Mark I'm lovely to be here and to meet you and have a chat. I'm excited to meet you. I when I get books or publishing companies send me books of their authors or am approached at all to to discuss different things it's really important for me to read the book and go through and understand the principles and honestly I have to be very honest with you the creativity factor, just here by judging the book from its title, I was intrigued, but I wanted to make sure I read it before. So I do a lot in innovation, creativity, education, and to speak with a lot of authors. And um, so I approached it with a very skeptical eye. Good. Not even probably 15 pages into it, you had me sold. I was hooked and I read it in, in a day and enjoyed it thoroughly and went back and re- reread it again to, to get some touch points on, on things that we could discuss here today and also some really crossover connection points for your work, for the science behind it, for, for what you've come up and created in this work that I see a lot in a lot of my colleagues and other authors and people that I've dealt with uh, over the years and how that's emerging. So first, I want to start out asking you to set up this moment in time, what brought you to to write this work. I know what it is, but those who haven't read the work don't know what it is, but it has to do with a little story as well. So I'd love for you to tell us that now, if you can. Yeah, absolutely. I think before I do that, start at maybe at the other end a little bit and then come back to that. Um, I had a UK book launch and last month. And I'm um, very flattered that a lot of people came to the book launch, even though England were playing football. So that, that was nice. But I gave my speech and only a short speech of about 10, 15 minutes. And I finished it by saying none of the words I said were my own. I I'd, I gave a speech using all the quotes or a lot of the quotes in my book. And I think that's pertinent that I think the science in my book 
is all out there and I was just bringing it together with to fit what I'd learned myself really I, I, I'm absolutely riding off the back of a lot of other science journalists authors and thinkers which is probably always the best way I suspect but to your point yeah I tell a specific story in the book but I guess it's the reality is it's there was a lot of those stories, but the one that I think you're mentioning is I'd actually, you mentioned Teach It in your introduction, which was a fantastic entrepreneurial journey for me and my wife. And we'd sold that and which I guess is people think is a success. You exit a business and I guess it is in a way, like a lot of exited founders, you then flounder around thinking what what's life now. But I went back to my roots and I'd studied as an archaeologist my undergraduate years. I'd always tinkered around, I'd always got my trowel out each summer and done a bit of archaeology, but I went back and studied for a master's. And to, to put myself at, you know, sort of out of my own comfort, I started signing up to speak at conferences and soon realised that was absolutely terrifying. From a business background, you know, you talk at things and I was, I was found that quite confident doing that and suddenly into a new world with really critical peers in the academic world. It was a terrifying thing. But one story was I was talking at one of these in Edinburgh in Scotland and just happened in in luck in hindsight that it was a very busy traffic day. I'd flown into Glasgow airport and my taxi got stuck in traffic on the way to the conference and I had almost no time until I was due to stand on stage and normally I would have got there early and probably like lots of people before a business meeting or speech would find a quiet spot in a cafe or an internet cafe or a hotel lobby keep reading their notes and trying to make it go in and that was that was what you did suddenly I faced this oh, I'm not going to make it so I just got out of the taxi and walked there and almost it sounds but it was almost walked straight in the door got my lanyard walked into the lecture theatre hundred couple of hundred people in this lecture theatre walked onto stage, plugged my USB in and had to give my speech because there was no time to go to the toilet or to look at my notes. And and it was brilliant. It was the best speech I've ever done. There were some scary academics in the audience, which if I'd known they were there and spotted them before would have sent a cold shiver down my spine. But it was definitely the best presentation I've given. And I got great feedback. And so it was rest of the conference happened, socialised, heard other people's speeches. And it was only reflecting afterwards that I realised I was an idiot and I'd always used walking for, for thinking. When I was running teaching and, and before and throughout my whole life, I'd always thought, like, my brain's addled, what do I do? I'll go for a walk. And But I'd never really put the two together and thought of it as a as a proper thing to do in business. So that was the beginning of it, really. And I'll let you ask me another question, maybe. And talk, but really, the next stage was I, I jump around. I got my master's in archaeology, and that was great. That was sort of a nice tick for myself. But actually, I then went back and when I was at the University of Bath or before, my jobs at University of Bath, I started a PhD in the School of Management. It was actually a PhD to do with Phoenician expansion into the Western Mediterranean, which is <laughs> so Bronze Age business. But actually, it took me down a rabbit hole of two things. One, the rabbit hole of, which I guess quite happened, happens when you're researching, kept going down this road of what's, what drives people to innovate and took me into this world of creativity and this was fiddling in my brain about outdoors and walking and what does that do. I naturally ended up at this research place with all these papers on my desk of this stuff, which eventually ended up in the book. Also totally put me off a PhD, which I realised writing a book was much better because there's you don't have to listen to those peers and write 80,000 words that no one's going to read. Hopefully it's 50,000 words that some people will read. So that was the sort of journey to start the process. I love that. that that's a fabulous story. And it's also what really connected and resonated I, in my work a lot, <clears throat> I work with, with nature and agriculture and environment. And I always say that it's hard, but that agriculture farming domesticated human beings. So before that time, we were hunters and gatherers and we walked and we were outside quite a bit. And then at the age of agriculture or farming, which is now looking back at upwards of 13,000 years or more. There are even some suggestions now through archaeology, which is also unique, that could be as well as 20,000 years ago to, to some respects. And in that process, yes, it took a lot of time, but then we became more sedentary. We spend a lot of time in the home and not as much time out there harvesting and turning the ground and also our impact on climate change. But there's a reversal on that saying that I say it as really 
work has domesticated us to be imprisoned in these boxes to today and, and sit behind these computers and look down and, and take not only a different form of ergonomics, but a huge domestication of trapping uh, of human beings uh, on the way we work. And it's like the more hours you spend behind the computer or confined in a conference room or in a building, the more productive or effective you are in some yeah. respects. And I, I would like to understand some of your thoughts and theories through your research and also in the book, how you feel about that trend as well. Do you also believe that work has really domesticated and trapped us into a kind of a failing system as far as what we're experiencing in our world and what's going on and not just when tough times like COVID or Brexit or things come or lockdowns come that, that confine us, but also that this way that we've set up our world of work has really is a trapping in many ways as far as you also in the book address ROI. And so I'd like to kind of see how you tie those together or what your thoughts are. Yes, oh, there's a lot to unpack there, Mark. I'll start with a quote that's in my book, um, which I've, I've pretty much commandeered from John le Carre, which a desk is a dangerous place from which to view the world. And I think there's a lot packed in there. But you're right. There's, I think that we're going to look back on this period. I say it in the book, and it's a quote from another person, actually, Michael. That we'll look back a bit like we currently or previously looked back at the Victorian work workhouses and mills, and and it's all the physiological side, all of our evolutionary side, all add up that this is not the place we do. We're not productive, we're not creative, and we're not, we're not well doing it. There's lots of bits in there that add up to that. But we're, as you say, it's the trap that we've been told that is work. And I think one of the calls I'm trying to say in the book is that we're sat at a desk now, I'm sat at my desk. We're not going to get away from that and our computers as tools to do work. But deep work and when i say deep work i especially mean thinking creativity thinking about innovation whether that's for your business or yourself i think they they both happen that doesn't generally happen at a desk and i think we all absolutely know that but we're trapped in the sort of classic work hard play hard and you know, work time me time and i'm starting to think that it's all me time yeah whether you're working or playing or with your family or doing other things which wouldn't be counted as work. I'd like to see a time when that's all accepted as part of work, if you like. I wanted the book to be accessible for business people, owners, venture builders, to start to explore that. Because to be a, a hard call to get companies to say, everyone can be wherever they like, working outside, walking up a mountain. Because there is, there is productivity to be done, and you mentioned the ROI side of it. But I think if you focus that return on investment in those really deep bits of business, which are thinking about the future, imagining what the future is going to be like, your strategy, how you're going to innovate, how you want your staff to think creatively at all levels. That's not necessarily coming up with the best new product or service. It might be just how I do things, how I feel better in my job. All those things add to productivity. And in the book, I go into some of the, I guess, the accepted specifics, all the science that's coming out about the benefits of a four-day week and, and that not affecting productivity. People are more productive because they get time to spend on other things. I tell a story in the book about a senior Googler that I talked to many years ago about their 70 20 10 rule about how they spend their time and the smaller percentage supposedly about thinking outside the box and innovating and i think eric smith's idea was that would be people working in the office still and coming up with new ideas because they didn't have to do their to-do list and uh, john who i spoke to said i said what do you do with your time he says oh, i just go home and at the time it seemed really strange to me i thought that's not what they expected but actually I think if he went home or walked through the park or went for a run or did something else, I think he was probably bringing more to the party than the people who felt they had to go to a room to be creative. Or So I've come full circle in that that is work. I try to put a lot of methodology in the book as well to frame that, but I've put that in because I do work outdoors with teams. And when you're having those conversations about what are we going to do for those three days in the wilderness, I can go through the science. There's plenty of science in the book about some great academic studies about how your creativity increases over time and, and about how those traditional methods of brainstorming don't work. So I, I'm, I can normally talk to companies about 
the benefits of doing it, but then it's, what are we actually going to do? And then really I want to say is let's just go for a walk and see what happens. But they want some structure and that's totally acceptable. So I've built methods through my own practice and working with people that answer your point, I think, is where they then see the ROI. You know, what they, the feedback is generally clarity of thought, the, all those ideas bouncing around, which are always there and people have them and they're on lists. It helps them properly process that as a group or individually. So that's a massive, that sort of clarity is, I think, one of the big things. And that leads directly into sort of business strategy. And I guess you asked the question, sort of, sometimes why does that happen? And I think back to your point as to evolutionary history, there's a whole section on the book, I know you've read it, which is we were actually, this is what we were designed to do. We are designed to be cognitively enhanced endurance athletes. We're designed to be outside moving in nature, doing things, thinking on the fly. That's what we were designed to do. And your point that maybe the agricultural revolution suddenly put, started to close that door on that. And in the 20th century, we slammed that door shut and said, stay inside your box and only go outside for your, your bit of exercise at the end of the day to de-stress. So hopefully I'm just trying to nudge that door open again. And <laughs> yeah, there, it's really interesting because there's a couple of different camps or thoughts. There's a big camp that is talking about the future of work. And you mentioned a four day work week. There's Tim Ferriss who talks about a four hour work week and how do we get out and how do we be more effective with our time and be more productive and do that. And then there's another camp where it's, we need you to clock in and out when you get to work. And when you get out of work, when you go on break, we need you to clock out. We need to manage every minute of time that you're here. Yes, we're thinking about productive ways that you can do your work. So what we've done is we've done an open office space with no cubicles, but everybody sits in this open transparent space. But uh, you have to go and check out your computer or you're never guaranteed the same sitting place the same day. If you get here early before everybody else, maybe you can have the same place more than once a day if you do that. And there's these kind of very strict rules around freedom or openness or this future of work. And in the innovation space, in the technology space, we've really been talking about the future of work for a long time, but that's all we've done is we've talked about it and we've created some ping pong tables and lava lamps and some foosball tables and bean bags and stuff, but we really haven't truly prepared the infrastructure, the human resources and the policies for that true future to arrive and what that really looks like. In what you just said, there are three areas that I want to touch in because you've already at early in the in the stage of our podcast opened up not a can of worms, but three things where we can really go deep. And I want to touch on those. One of them is I don't even know if I should bring it up, but I'm going to because I'm I'm a troublemaker. I'm a rebel. Is Brexit. So Brexit, specifically for the United Kingdom, you're in the United Kingdom, is the fact that they've created a system there where they're, they're upset about jobs and there was a racial factor in there, migrant workers, food workers and things. It passed, it's changed now. Are we on the fourth prime minister or the fifth? I can't remember, it's so many, <laughs> but but. What happened is it was really about taking jobs, about outside people coming in and working so often. What happened is two things, the COVID and the pandemic and also the Brexit at the same time. And now those people were no longer there and nobody in the United Kingdom jumped into those jobs. And the infrastructure, the future of those, the way those jobs functioned were filled in a specific way by specific people, wonderful people, but that's also an outdated model. And so I think there are some huge tumultuous things that, that we saw and experienced because we actually have jobs that are not so desirable, but yet we feel like it's a burden on society or something and we make a, ha a rash decision like Brexit to change that but then very few, I think it's even less than 1% of 
of those who voted for Brexit jumped into those jobs that now were left empty to be filled. What is that telling us? And I don't, I, I don't want you to be too controversial, but I want to say, why do we see that? How does that happen? And what does that tell us about the future of work? Not just about being outside, but the way we've created that work. Gosh, another big question. I guess that there's two things there, isn't there? Plenty more than that, but Okay, I guess COVID more than Brexit fundamentally changed how people work. And that's definitely something people are starting to come to grips with. And you mentioned you know, there's leaders and teams who want everything back to normal, please. And that brings in the issues of Brexit as well. So nothing is normal anymore, is it, in this country? But for the rest of the world as well, COVID has made most things not normal. So that's and I want to caveat that I'm not just picking on you. It's not just yeah. the United Kingdom. There's yeah. there's different forms of Brexit and things going on all around the world. But I, I'm just I because that's where you're at, and I think you've actually run into this. So I would love to hear more about it. Yes. So the COVID side absolutely has changed the nature of work already, and I guess it's how is hopefully using that as a positive platform to question how we work. And I think there are lots of companies now doing that. And it absolutely brings pressures of the leadership in the sense of trust, letting go. How do we communicate as a team? And I think most of us are fed up of, to some degree, of this type of communication. And <laughs> and definitely, I'm getting a lot more interest in, in, in teams wanting to use the outdoors as a place just to communicate. And there's lots of benefits in, in, in using that in terms of hierarchies breaking down and having different conversations and plenty of science around that. The Brexit point, I think, is fundamentally more worrying in a way, because I think we you know, a lot of companies will find their way to at least question how work happens because of COVID. And maybe that's a real positive. At least there's a big question mark. Is, is the way we did things right? Has what's happened ruined us? And for a lot of companies, it hasn't and it's opened up new doors. So I think there's a lot of positive out of that side of things. The sort of jingoistic approach of COVID, I think, is a dangerous thing in a global market, full stop, isn't it? And probably not to talk about politics, guessing that my politics are, that's a bad thing, and I don't know, it's not for everyone. How does that affect the future of work? Having conversations with different people. There's a story in my book about Adam Kahana, who very high-level sort of facilitator who helped governments here. One of the story in the book is about Ecuador. and and helping disparate groups communicate and come together. Now he uses the outdoors, it's why it's in the book, as walking and talking as a tool. But the fundamental bit there is that there's so much more to be gained from cross-cultural, cross-border work and communications. Again, a lot of us work for companies which are global. So it seems absolutely nuts in this modern world that there's this jingoistic political approach to shutting down borders as far as work is concerned. Not to get into the details of the, of the practical impact, outcomes of that for the country in terms of work but yeah I don't want to say and, and, the, from, and yeah. the reason i mean <laughs> i bring, bring it up it wasn't political at all yeah. but it's a telltale of our work infrastructures our work the way we work set up to be in a lockdown situation set up to be in a situation where sometimes even the borders are closed and does that open up new job opportunities for locals and are they willing to take those jobs so is, has unemployment now that all those jobs i think it was between 400,000 migrant employees workers a year to clear up to 600,000 migrant workers a year to the united kingdom for food jobs for farming agriculture food processing grocery stores hospitality work. Were those jobs all filled? Is unemployment back down? And the way it ties to nature, walking and outdoors is because I said, I mentioned the fact migrant workers, they're not people born and raised in the United Kingdom. They are traveling from their home countries, from other places around the world to be there to work because they don't mind those type of jobs. And regardless of the decision made, was the infrastructure of that work prepared? And I, the answer is no, <laughs> obviously. And that's why I brought it up. But there was two other reasons, two other things that I wanted to dive into is obviously there's a, there's a lot of humanity that spent a lot of work time before work 
and after work preparing for work. And I, I, I don't know how you phrase this or how you look at it. A lot of people who work Monday through Friday, they're saying, oh, I have the Mondays. It's a Monday. And there's this whole thing that they spend the entire weekend or even all their Sunday preparing for the Monday to go to work because they dread it. And some people, they've got to get rest and go out and exercise on those evenings or mornings or the weekends mm -hmm. just to prepare to be mentally and physically ready to do a job whatever their job is and that and i and then there's during especially during this time there's 86 percent job dissatisfaction around the world and what people do for work and that's why a, a lot of them are spending so much time preparing before and after just to, to go to work and so i want to hear from you what are you seeing what's the research what ha have you discovered is this true what how do we fix that how do we say boy i work 40 hours a week but i also spend another 10 to 20 hours just preparing to go and back so it's really 50 hours and that's time that i could spend with my loved ones or working on myself to do what i want Yes, I guess there's top and bottom end to that, isn't there? The fact yeah. of the how leaders and companies should view success and productivity and absolutely employee well being should be a should be a central KPI, shouldn't it? The KPIs that are reported at the board table of, of sales or if you're a tech company, engagement or whatever, and absolutely of the belief that employee well-being should be a core KPI. Because if you get that, all the others will work out. And putting aside any business of bad apples, wrong people in wrong jobs, you know, there's always going to be that. But as a general rule, I think some measure of KPI of well-being at the top level and accepting the findings of that, not just as, oh, we did well this month and whatever it, our measure would be is up 2%, but actually why, what do our staff need? So that's part one, I think that's important. And I do a lot of work with a fantastic company in the UK called Teacup, that I mentioned a few times in the book, who brought a lot of the learnings from sport and high performance in the sense of if you're gonna be a high performing athlete, you need to think about your whole existence holistically is not just trained and we'll have there's plenty of books about this you know but now elite sports people also have to think obviously about diet and nutrition but also about just relaxation and meditation or whatever it might be it's a very holistic view so they tried to bring some of that science through a project actually at the university of Bath, where i got to know them into a, an absolute measure of that but i think the interesting thing they do and i'm not trying to sell them i'm, I'm saying as, as a principle so you get the board get the kpis but actually, the, their approach is very individual to the... So you're not trying to... Back to your point, it's not... You know, the answer to making our stuff happier isn't building a games room. The answer for Mark might be something very specific. And that's what it's trying to do. So I think acceptance of that's important. And, and then if you have organisations that accept that, it then gives the freedom for... It should give the freedom for individual employees to break that pattern you've talked about. I have a presenter 23-3 war, but the important bit is, and again, there's plenty of science to say, even a 20 minute walk without your tech in nature or being out in nature for 20 minutes. And when I take teams out, I do a very short, I don't do forest bathing, I call it forest dipping, just you're sitting out in nature for five minutes silently. There's these real short routes to the sort of default mind, mode of your brain, and which just puts you in one in a good mood, which is always good but it frames you to do much better at your job. So I think there are little things that individuals could do. And I was actually just this morning reading an article in the, in the Guardian here in the UK by a great journalist called Joel Snape, who was lamenting the New Year's resolutions of people doing ice bucket challenges or whatever, deep things to reset their body. And he started with the premise that I don't want to do those. They sound hard. I'm quite lazy and did some research. <laughs> And found out that actually one of the issues with, and I'm not trying to knock these things, one of the issues for going for a, a really taxing bicycle ride or running a triathlon or doing really the hard stuff that people try to cram into those short weekends because they're hard at work. They're great for your fitness and your body, don't get me wrong, but they're not actually that great for your brain. Yeah, you'd be better just to slow down and 
take an extra 20, 30 minutes walking to work with your phone off before you sit down at your desk. I think that would have much more benefits than probably anything else. But the employers need to allow people the time and freedom to do that and realize that it's beneficial. And I think the individual bit, for you, that might be doing it at 7 a.m. For someone else, it might be doing it at 9, 30, 10 a.m. I worked a long time in education. You mentioned teach it. And education never changes. Yeah, policy and governments tend to really not change education over any length of time. Little things change. But there's loads of reports in education that school shouldn't start at 8 a.m. Plenty and plenty of science that that's really bad for kids' brains. Whack them into school at, in the UK anyway, into school at 8, working at 8.30, doing maths questions. And then in the afternoon, you do some PE, some physical. There's plenty of science that says that should be entirely the other way around. And yeah. that's, that's kids developing. We're still the same people as we were when we were kids. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it, there, it are, definitely there does. are simple, simple things the individual can do. But I think what I'm really keen on is... And mine's only one way, walking in nature, but I think the, that acceptance, the employee well-being in its deepest sense, not just some gift vouchers and a fruit basket, has massive payoffs for companies. I agree. In the discussing the future of work anyway, is a big talk, topic for a lot of my colleagues and what I've done over the years. And um, you, you mentioned innovation and you mentioned key performance indicators, so KPIs. I think that one, innovation is basically futurism. It's about the future. It's about how do we do impact innovations for purpose. And it's a very tran transformational, transitional tool to get us there and involves a lot of creativity but when we get into this key performance indicators i tend to cringe a little bit because it's a past performance indicator it's history it's gone and we can't predict the future based on history it's usually ends up repeating itself and then in the same conjunct the same guise of kpis you also mentioned this high performance athletes most people will have 40 years at least of work and to expect a high performance athlete for 40 years 40 <laughs> hours a week in an old yes. infrastructure is a recipe for failure we want people who are regenerative that are around for a long time and that also those businesses are around for a long time instead of just the annual reviews and the boards and did they meet those goals and the goals get, always get higher and harder and you're constantly in this competition factor i think if you're a high performance athlete which most whether it's olympics or any other sport those are short careers and most of them are start young and they're only 10 years long it's very yeah. rare that you see oh yeah as football player for 40 years and was fabulous all along, never got traded. Whatever the athlete is, tennis players, something happens where they get an injury, they get old, someone younger who's worked their, sorry, their ass off, it just replaces them. That's not a very bright future. It's not one of work because, it, which is sad because work supports our life. It supports our family. It pays our insurance and makes sure that we're healthy and happy. And so with that mindset of key performance indicators and we're, we need to perform like a key athlete, that means that we've got to do a lot of pre-work. And this is what I mentioned before, before we go to work and after just to, to maintain that level of action. And I just wanted to make that comment based upon mm. what you said, but it ties into the second point that I want to do. Can I just ask a question on that, Mark? Sure, please. Take. I totally agree that I guess most athletes, you know, elite athletes are going to peak in their, like you say, teens and late teens, 20s, depending on the sport. But do you think there's, is there a peak time for, let's say, creative innovators? Is there a peak time? Because it's probably not when you start out, is it? Is, is your peak performance 10 years if you've kicked into your career? Or I guess it's very variable, isn't it? It's really variable. And so there's been numerous studies on that as well. Most of the studies that I read is the biggest innovators are almost towards retirement age. It's the Frank Lloyd Wrights, the Buckminster Fullers, the Fritz Hof Capras, the Lynn Margulis's, the Carl Sagan's, the... That's about the later, wiser years of their life that they start yeah. to do this. And there are many young innovators, the 
that have spent a lot of time to do that, the Elon Musk, the Thomas Edison's and that, but most of what we see is, is, a, is the, I hate to say it, it's not even golden years, but they're up there. Mm. On I, wonder, wisdom. I wonder if that is, obviously experience plays a part, but I wonder back to your point about that future side, absolutely, but you don't get anywhere without imagined futures and you find ways to generate what the future could be. Do you think that is that experience which leads to that or is it age freedom just leads to your ability to imagine the future better? I don't know. It's an interesting question. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with in those younger years, we're just competing to catch up, to get up to speed with that collective intelligence that has been learned around the world. And whether it's the Elon Musk's or the young innovators, even younger innovators of our time, the boiling slates who do the ocean cleanup project, or mm -hmm. I'm trying to think some of the other younger innovators. They spend a lot of time to just get up to speed. Others are also have a form of a genius factor in them as well. And so they're early adapters and pioneers of the thing. But they're Bertrand Picard, Dr. Bertrand Picard, the first man to fly around the world in the solar impulse airplane. He's not a young man, but he's an adventurous. Richard Branson started out in younger years, but he's also getting up there in, in years. And I think some of these stories is there's that understanding of the way the world works. And it's not just sheer wisdom, but it's that experience that the more we interact with nature, the more we have that symbiosis with nature and harmony with our natural world. And we imply those models into our life and into that, it, we realize it's a better model. It's not just a better model for life. It's a better model for business instead of being extractive and capitalistic, which all have a limit to growth. Yeah, there might be exorbitant amount of wealth or growth or GDP, but eventually there's a time where the, it just runs off and collapses and, and goes to an end. And I, what, in your book, you have a lot of wonderful examples. And this is to the, to the third point that I wanted to bring up is you have the former CEO of Patagonia, Lon Chon, Chon, Chindre here. I can't even never say his last name. Fabulous guy, spends a lot of time outside for many years, didn't even have a cell phone, does a lot of telephone conversations, but most of his time is outside thinking, climbing, walking. Then you have the Tim Cooks and the Steve Jobs and who this barefoot hippie, relaxed techie and walking around a lot, but also create a working environment that is somehow tied to nature. There's a lot of walking. There are big, huge campuses where they walk around. They have different form of connection to they're trying to bring the nature in, inside in some respects, but they're also building these huge campuses that they need to walk around and communicate and go to this department or that department to engage with their people. And that there's a lot of not just outside forest or outdoor nature walking, but there's a physical movement in the way they've structured their organization that a good part of their day is spent in that local commute, that office or campus commute of how they do their work, which I think is really interesting. And I wanted to address that because most of the successful people, even Tim Ferriss, I mentioned him earlier, the four hour work week, he spends a lot of time kind of walking and traveling around, focusing on health and being effective use of time. He spends a lot of time on podcasts and behind the computer as well, but it's a lot less than those walking meetings and those discussions and the retention of his mind and the knowledge is a lot of that work occurs and creativity, that innovation occurs through communication and retention in one's brain capacity that then when they get behind the computer or when they're cooking the meal or when they're trying to produce the computers or do the production, that it's then exactly know what they need to do and it's done, it gets done and that actual work or productivity time is more effective whereas if you i'm in germany so if you look at a government worker in germany they probably spend not even four hours an entire week on actual work and the rest of the time is just off drifting and 
going to the coffee machine and the water machine and not really actually doing the work because the whole setup is so confined. The way we work is so weird. This leads me to two things. So I'm also a techie. I also have one of my first degrees in computer science and I love technology. And I kind of sense that not only are you an educator, but you have this techno lust or tech techie kind of background, even though you're, you said your degree was in archaeology, right? Am I correct? Is that true? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and, yeah, and so, so I, I, so so I, I never, wanted... never went to work as an archaeologist. I worked out uh -huh. in the States actually in, in tech in the, yeah, from sort of early 90s. So yes, absolutely it's there. And now dived back in to be co-founder of a new tech company. So yes, absolutely. And the ties of that, that last, the three things that you brought up where I mentioned Pant Pantagonia Outdoors and Steve Jobs and Boylan Slate Ocean Cleanup Project, a lot of big innovators and companies and front runners, they're doing a lot more planetary services, which are tied to the outdoors and cleaning up our environment and nature. They're doing a lot more regenerative agriculture, permaculture. They're doing a lot of companies that how can we make our built environment better, our world cleaner. And there is still that form of technology, but most technology and mechanization and heavy industry, we're trying to get into AI and to mechanization so that it's automated, which inherently would give us social distancing, would let robots take over menial jobs and tasks that humans shouldn't be doing anyway, can't do it as effective anyway, and give us something of more meaning and creativity for the future work. But the reason I bring up techie and educator, and you can answer, you can dive more into that third question, but this really ties to it. So I am a big head of, if you believe something, you're an innovator in that, that you also live and breathe it, or you find tips and tools and tricks, and you've included those in the book, but I want to go even further. So in your experience as an educator, you get to the classroom and how is your classroom set up? Mostly in chairs and mostly a student sitting down and sometimes even the professor sitting down where they probably should be standing, lecturing, showing slides, presentations, standing up and that. Um, how do we see that environment change and your techie background? How do we see that environment changing as well in the area of ergonomics? And this is so that we can bring that outdoors and that walking and a different form of doing business for the future that ties to the outdoors and walking and bring that into the future of work. And my, I guess the statement for you to now address that is, we are in the Anthropocene of chairs. There are six to eight chairs per person on this earth. That means minimum 60 billion chairs on our earth. We go from sleeping in the bed to standing up, sitting at the table to eat breakfast, maybe sitting in the shower or the bathtub to shower, sitting in the bus or car to go to work. Then we go to sit to get to work. Then we sit down to at our work and at our desk. We sit down to go to lunch and it's taking lives off of our time out and life away from us as human beings on our health, on longevity of life, but it's also changing the future. We're becoming more sedentary in the way we do things. How do you think, as someone who believes the science and has done that, how can we change those environments so that in the future, you're not going to be saying, hey, we need to go outside and walk and do working meetings and team buildings outside, that we change the future of work to shorten it to those four day work weeks, to shorten it to those things, to have that more productivity and effectiveness in the, the way we do things. As you see, I'm standing now, I lecture a lot, I speak all over the world, and I've been standing for over 28 years. I have standing desks. Before that time, I used to turn a garbage can upside down and put my computer on top of it. And people looked at me like crazy, but Sitting is the new smoking, our world, and we need to figure out ways to get back into just natural ways, a better lifestyle. Once you've answered that kind of or talked to me about what your research and what you've discovered about that, I want to really, the next question, because I want to set it up because we're going into this journey, 
of this work-life balance. And I want to have a little discussion about that, what your thoughts and studies and what you've researched and what you talk about in the book as well. Okay. Firstly, uh, I left at the uni last year to join the switch and it will join up in this, what I'm going to talk about now. So my last unit I was teaching at the University of Bath was to, uh, computer science, postgrads actually. And I was teaching a course on entrepreneurship. So uh, basically that the idea, if I was being cynical, the uni's idea was stay here, do more research and maybe think about your own business. Don't go and work for Facebook or, but the idea was we did a, got them in into groups and got them to take an idea and put it through the mill to see if just conceptually, is there a business in here? What would I have to think about, et cetera. So it's a fun course. So I had 180 students signed up to that course. And to your point, I stood up in the front of a big lecture theater with the slides on. So I stood up and walked around. I think out of 180, the most people who ever came into the lecture theater now was about 35. Everyone else was sat in their student rooms streaming it. So it was live streamed and recorded. Ping, ping, everyone's watching it. Campus here, most of the student accommodation or a lot of it is on campus. So some of them were probably in their rooms 200 meters from where I was stood up delivering the lecture. So I found that very strange. They, so that's one thing. So that's a hard thing to break, isn't it? So they are sat, not only just sat, some of them in the lecture theater who've made the effort to come, but some of them have literally just sidled out of bed and stuck their headphones on and sat there so it's hard isn't it to know how that could change and i suspect obviously the big driver of that was covid that everything suddenly was live streamed but to take that a big leap forward i'm not going to talk much about about ear switch but the startup we're involved in is actually designed for good to help people with things like motor neuron disease ways of communicating and acting with the world when they've lost all their muscle control, whether that's severe cerebral palsy, using a muscle in their ear. So it started with great things, but the tech has moved on quite a lot. And one of the areas where the key areas for us is, is AR. So is controlling, controlling things you're viewing in AR. Now we don't make the tech, the tech's got a long way to go, it's, but I like the concept of AR as a freeing thing you now putting aside the, the risk that it's taken over by the moths of advertising which will always be there but I, if i'm being a bit altruistic i can imagine a world where you can be out in the na in nature with all the benefits of nature of moving your body and so there's science as you've read in the book around optimal speeds as a specific speed of walking which gets you in this default mode which makes your neurons fire you're not moving too fast and there's great physiological history is our most efficient moving speed and you link that to the another great study book by Benjamin Baird called Inspired by Distraction which is one of the first papers which took me on this journey was our brains are at their most creative not when we're working we're doing a really taxing task so not I'm gonna I'm gonna do this I'm gonna write this book I'm gonna sit here and tap and read loads of stuff and not when we're just relaxing lying on the sofa our brains fire most in this little bit in the middle of, of a slight distraction doing a slightly distracting task and luckily walking in nature and all that goes with it in terms of where your feet are going the fractal patterns of what you're looking at all instantly it's a shortcut basically to get you in this state i can foresee a world where that is work you've got some smart glass on and you are having a conversation or you're partaking in something or you're learning something but you are free to do that whether you're walking through the city, through the park, whether you're up the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. So that, that would be my dream, that that is that technology allows that freedom, but gives universities or employers the confidence that those people are learning, participating, working. I think technology can help. Now, may, maybe that's a dream too far, but I do quite like AR as a concept. I think it's got a lot of Going back to where I started, that AR in terms of people with disabilities and assistive technology is a fantastic thing in terms of allowing. As a, one of the inspirations for this, which was a young man called Jonathan Bryant, who, who's got severe cerebral palsy, can hardly move any parts of his body, can't talk. And he wrote a book when he was 13 called I Can Write, as in EYI, using his eye tracker. And the call for the book, as he said, was I haven't got learning diff diff difficulties. He's a really clever guy. I don't have learning difficulties, I've got communication difficulties. And the education system is putting me into this learning difficulties. I've got no problem learning, I just can't communicate. I think AR 
and you're starting to get hopefully uh, the tech does excite me um, especially when there's some good but I also see it is place in the future of work that it could have a place to allow people to not sit at their desk to move around and I think they personally but also the organizations they work for would see productivity are all the things they want to see as a result of that because combining those two things or combining all those things the fact of movement and what that does to your brain the fact of looking and being in nature rather than in some square rooms and walls and doing something not just totally relaxing is a powerful set of tools together maybe proper deep tech in ar does have a place in the future of work I also really wanted to maybe thought what your ideas of more, how do we create the future of work and the ergonomics? I touched on the ergonomics as well. Up, up until recently, there's not a lot of schools that have the op opportunity to stand, to have a standing desk for students. We're, we're in their education, whatever level of education, even higher learning, there's not a lot of opportunities for that. And we're boxing in the future of our things. And I wanted to tie that to this work-life balance. How can we talk about it? Can we offer these solutions that you, you have the science, you have some really good facts that the ROI is so much positive if we combine nature, walking, the outdoors, and our life experiences. But no matter what tool we found is the world, is our country, our city, our state that we live in prepared for the future of work based on policy, infrastructure? Are those new companies are there companies, new companies popping up around all over the place like Apple or Boylant Slate or these new office buildings that you see, these campuses for the future of work to be ready to help people transition into that to even to get there? Can we do? You no, know, in Germany, it's almost impossible to have a four hour work week to have to be considered to have a permanent or a full time contract. They have they have clauses in there it says 38 hours, 36 hours, something like that is the minimum to be have a permanent full time contract. And if you reduce that, you can't who came up with that stupid rule. So what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is policy regulation governance for businesses or infrastructure how have we looked at that? And then how do we get that built environment of schools or the future of education, the future of technology to, to be conducive of that? Or are we just talking about these innovations or these great tools that have ex actually existed forever, but there's no way to put them into true practice because it's a fight or uphill battle. I'll give you one example that maybe can tie to that, that I right? had someone say, boy, I'm, I'm, I get so tired and I get neck pain by sitting at work and looking at this computer. Th this was probably 11 years ago. How can I get one of these standing desks? Back then they had these cardboard monkey desks that you could put on your desk and to raise it up to, to stand. And I says, boy, I'd like to have my workplace be a little more ergonomic and feel I'll feel better. And they did started doing that at home and they knew it was effective. And they said, my work won't let me, they won't pay for it. They won't let me change the office furniture. I can't bring in. They, uh, they said, I have to go to the doctor and get a physical therapy note that I need a standing desk in order to do it. And I, th I think the world's gotten much better in that respect, but we come up with these practices and our work-life balance is totally out of place. We're living a separate life or at work or functioning much different at work than we actually would function at home. And so I want to know your thoughts and what your insights that you see in, in that direction as well. Yeah, I'm not confident that policymakers will do much about it in this country anyway. I think it's got to be people's push, hasn't it? I think you need enough companies 
thinking differently that best staff start to choose those companies and demand them. That's probably always the best way. So that we have to get enough innovative companies to embrace new ways of doing things. Eventually, hopefully it becomes the norm, but at least it allows enough people to question other companies' ways of doing things. Hopefully my book's a little bit about, I'll tell a story, there's a fantastic company near me they're quite a big tech agency. So they're not, you know, not an Apple, not huge, but they made the decision actually during lockdown. So they have an office, very traditional office. It's quite a nice office in that, in, in, in the funky way. But they built about 20 minutes from their office in lockdown, they built a forest office. So they now have two site office and the forest office is, is covered. So you're, you are, but it's not heated. So you're outside, but it, they fitted it with, they have fitted it with desks and wi-fi so maybe there's a step for them to go and they have veg beds and other stuff there and so it was definitely it was a response to covid how can we start to work together without going into the office and be socially distanced but post it all the feedback from staff and themselves is this is the way we now want to work so you have a choice you go to the physical office part of the day you want the 20 minute walk to the forest office and work there you want to take your meetings there so they're definitely on that step of having been forced to experiment with something to realise that this works and the staff like it. I do see the shoots of it happening in some companies. I guess I'm more cynical. Perhaps I'm more cynical about the big companies. The campus approach you know, is the massive new Google building being built in right in the centre of London at King's Cross on campus. And I've been in the building next door and looked down on it and it's a, it's a sort of skyscraper on its side and you can see they are building green spaces into it but I suspect it is basically still be a workhouse inside really. Yeah, I'm more cynical of big companies. I think innovation does tend to come from smaller companies. So I'm seeing the shoots of that which I think is quite interesting. To so the work-life balance bit, I think that's back to where I started. I think it's that acceptance that they're all, almost part of the same as such a, whether we're a four hour or 36 hour, back to your hunter gatherer, work life was the same thing. Yeah. My work was my life. My life was my work. It was all outdoors. And I know we're not going to get back to that, but the sort of concept that it's wrong to go and sit in a box for eight hours, shut the door, and then my life begins. And I think that's been a problem for a very long time. So I don't know what the answer is, Mark. I think there's, you need more smaller innovative companies just trying different things. But I think people have to push it really. And I, I see people are starting to push it in their own ways, employees. But we also have to be aware that I have this conversation quite often about the work I do. And um, which is why I try to make it accessible because there is lots of jobs where it is just really hard to do that will be nhs frontline staff in the uk they're not going to get their 20 minute walk probably so what's the answer for a lot of those jobs i don't know i think you could take a long view where you know you have more staff and you allow them to work more flexible time and shorter hours so they can regenerate and replenish themselves but i suspect their actual time at work is still going to be pretty intense <laughs> although i guess a lot of them aren't sat at a desk in a chair staring at a screen um, in, so in germany the, they have in germany they have this thing it's like a prevention health thing for all employers that there's i think it's 40 hours a year and a certain amount of 500 euros. It's probably even gone up to 1500 euros a year now and monies for prevent, prevention to improve your health at work or has to do with ergonomics and training and outdoors and making sure that you're preventing any future issues. And part of that is this just health and outdoor bathing and out, being getting outside and better breaks and better work structure. But uh, I see so many tools throughout your book that you give on thinking outside and the your 23-3 rule. And as you talk about the stories and, and the factor of that, what is your hope or dream and desire for those who read the book? Is it just to, I'm not even going to say it. What is your true hope and dream desire of those who read the book to, to take away and be able to do that? I know you do your own walks and you also do team building and things as well, which is super for creativity, innovation and that as well. But is there, can you give us your own surmise of what your takeaway is for everybody? Yeah, I think it's twofold. So for individuals, 
I think I've hopefully honed it in that 23-3 rule, which is let's just make it really simple about spending time in nature. Do the methodology if you like, but I think if you just, and I've adopted this now for a long time, and you know, it, it, it really works, is you know, if you can spend, and let's say I, I'm Michael Easter was actually from an idea of theirs, I've tweaked it a bit, but 20 minutes a day outside in nature, ideally walking without your phone, three hours every couple of weeks on a proper, let's call it a hike, I think that'd be ideal, but given people's of just, again, out in nature, and the really powerful one, and all the science racks up, is once a quarter, go somewhere for three days where you're going to spend almost all of that in nature because the what that does to your brain increases exponentially in day three. You read this as a great experiment that happened in, in the States with Ruth Ashley where you know the levels of creativity, and you can take that as a proxy for lots of things, but it's getting your brain in a really nice default state. The creativity is a measure of that. Rise incredibly on that third day. So I hope for individuals, regardless of who they work for, that is just a good equivalent of your five a day vegetables, just something you can build into your life and you will feel better. You will have more ideas if you want more ideas and you will have more clarity of thinking by doing that. If you want to do the methodology, and this is, I guess, the business bit, is I think it is, I've spent years being forced, let's call it forced, I always questioned it, to use the business canvas. And you're sitting in a dull room trying to work with an early stage company about their strategy and innovation, and it's awful. So I think for businesses, my call is don't book that meeting room in a soulless hotel thinking you're going to have some blue sky thinking and fantastic new ideas just don't do it anymore it's it does not work you take that outside whether that's with a facilitator like me whether that's on your own and don't get me wrong i'm not saying you don't end up writing some things on a flip chart or capturing some stuff but that's my call to the business just don't do that anymore that we've got to do an away day next quarter and this is our agenda in terms of most people's agendas on those is future looking. They tend to think, oh, those strategies, we're going to think about the next year. Just don't do that. Take that outside. So those are my two ends. Businesses, stop that behavior of booking some horrible course or training room. And for individuals, just, yeah, just spend more time in nature without your tech and you will properly see the benefits. And hopefully there's a middle ground where those come together and affect some future of work change. I, I, before we get off this work-life balance, I want to get your inputs or your feelings as well. I ask people a lot of the time, what are the models that they're operating in in a typical day of their life? So is it a very capitalistic or an extractive model? Are they part of a religion or a culture? Do they have a family life and a work life? And what are all the different models that they live in a typical day? And it's usually more than three models every single day in their life. But at the very least, it's two. It's usually this work model. It's what they do at work and who they are at work. And it's what, they're, what they would like their life at home to be. And those two models or those two work and life are usually going in different directions. And it's also a way <clears throat> for you humanity to be disconnected from nature, but it's also a way of almost feeling this bipolarness that we're two different people in the same day. We're going in two different directions. We're just doing the job because we need it to pay the bills and we need it to give us the lifestyle and health care and the food that we need on the table. But when we're at home, we don't want to see any work colleagues that we just want to spend time with our family or drinking a beer, watching soccer or whatever we do. Maybe we're an athlete, maybe we do sports, maybe we do go out into nature, but when we are, we're not thinking much about our work because we want to forget about it. We want to have it be a nine to five job or, or a position that we don't have to put them a lot of thought into it after, but that creates this 
inner turmoil in humans that you know we hear we've heard about it for decades i'm sure you have this work life balance and that's why i bring it up because when we get behind the science of it when we get behind the realities of it are we living a psychotic life are we living a bipolar life where we're trying to please two masters at once just because that's what we need to survive and how can we instead of this work life balance how can we create a lifestyle that even if we work for a tech company, even if we work for a production company that requires us to stand on an assembly line for eight hours a day or seven hours a day, that we can still have this lifestyle that we've created of joy and happiness. We feel connected to nature and that. And I think those are the tools that I would like to know how you feel about it, but how can we apply what we're getting from this book besides the 23-3 rule to really bring that into a new paradigm of how we create the, that lifestyle of the future of the innovation aspect that we talked about earlier, that how do we reach that True future, because I think that's eventually where we want to be. We don't, I don't want to make your your writings or your life obsolete, but I would like us to not say, hey, are you connected to nature? Are you doing environmental social governance? Are you doing sustainability? Are you or I would like that to be the way the world works in the future. I would like instead of talking about the future of work, we actually create a different paradigm of the way the world works in the future that is connected to nature, is connected to environment. We realize that big organism that we see outside, the organism of life and nature, that is the best model for our organizational structures and our organizational models that, that we see at work. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and reflections and maybe tips that you can give us. Yes. There's a lot there, isn't there? I make it simple. Yeah, <laughs> it'll always be a lot. It'll be complexity in systems, but I want to hear it. I'm sure, just reflecting personally, I'm sure I'm like, as you started that, like most people, I have a lot of people, I have a family life, I have kids and older relatives, and I have a number of jobs, which I think suits some people, doesn't suit other people. I often say I'm a natural tinker. It suits me to have four different jobs as opposed to one and maybe that's a maybe that's a good reflection for a lot of people maybe that is a way to think about your work and life differently is maybe there's a time coming when there's been a lot of talk hasn't there about people not having one career but having four in their lives now may i guess it's it's, it's been driven by people living longer i think and there's another way to view it that actually you change your brain changes and maybe you should embrace that. And there's always, all these discussions are always partly parking economic priorities, aren't they? So, <laughs> as you said, you do need to earn money to pay bills. Yeah, I think very personally, I've always given myself the freedom to be curious in terms of work and allow that to take multiple forms and not that stress me. But definitely for me, there's no doubt that just nature and the outdoors is the medicine for that and uh, there's a movement here in the uk for social you know, i'm sure it's not just the uk social sp prescriptions and walking is now one of those so there's a trial actually in my local area of doctors prescribing walking for people but it's missing the point isn't it because to then be, whenever you prescribe something it's because you've gone too far down some problem of health so it's back to the same point i think is that your nature is a really powerful thing to have in your life um, for all sorts of purposes. So that's always my first call and whatever form that takes. I talk in the book about my time as an archaeologist and there's lots in archaeology in terms of academic thought, etc. But actually working outdoors, it's a bit like being a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot to be said for that. I and mean, that's probably why your brain works well in interpreting what you're doing. To a bigger side of that, I think it's interesting, isn't it, that you think about the big policy things happening in the world in terms of the meetings like COP. We had COP Glasgow a while back here. And supposedly all of the movers and shakers in thinking about the environment and on a global scale basically took over every hotel room in Glasgow, didn't they? And, and I know yeah, that was crazy. Flew in, flew in in their private jets. And to my very small point of a company saying, don't book a ballroom, go and do something which connects you with nature because you'll get a lot more out of it. That just seems madness to me. 
that that's the way that thinking is trying to happen. I don't know if that answers your question in any way. <laughs> yeah, I, same, same way I just, I was at COP26 in Glasgow and, and mm. I actually stayed a little bit, about an hour and a half or maybe even more. I was about two hours away from Glasgow and had to drive every day to get into the COP. But it, it, it is sheer madness. And I just came from COP27 in November from Egypt in Sharm el Sheikh. And it's sheer insanity what occurs there and has very little to do with outdoors or the nature, although we're talking about nature and environment, how we protect it and do it. It's that there's, there's always this thing that brings us back to the time behind the desk, the time behind the computer, the part that how do we do those negotiations? How do we write the proposals or do the things that are necessary to fulfill the mission or to fulfill the order to do the job that we need to do? And those can't, they can't always be done in nature, but I mm -hmm. believe that connection to nature or to being outside gets you into the thinking that the origins of everything, of products, food, resources, the environment that we're talking, all starts outside in nature. That's where the resources come to build the computers that we're talking on, to build the internet, the fiber optic lines or the satellites that are all created from resources outside and they're ma mainly the wiring and cables are outside buried or above ground one way or the other and the to disconnect ourselves from food or nature or the way the world really works or those models it, it is a big mistake and that's why organizations have that limit to growth or that collapse factor or disruptive factor is because they lose sight of their supply chain and how those long processes work, but also that our infrastructures around the world are out of date and keeping up to speed with our exponentially growing world and how the world really works. And that's why earlier I mentioned, how can we get those policies in line that we can still do work, we can still have a job and we can still be productive, but how do we combine it more with nature? How do we make sure those policies and those things are in place that when we innovate and say, boy, you know what? Working just four hours a week is a hell of a lot more productive than 40 hours a week. And here's why. And, but then we come up with this idea and the science behind it. And then the policy of your government or where you live or the infrastructure is not it's not broadband is not a human right for you to be able to work outside in nature or the employment laws are not set up to be able to do that. So no matter how great we find the science or that the infrastructure and the policy and governance of that system is not ready for that transition. And so it forces us back into almost the definition of insanity of how we're doing, how we're living as human beings. I just think it's so crazy that we can create our, our work from life, that those aren't one, one thing, and they have been one thing for many decades yeah. and eons. And it's just since the Industrial Revolution where it's really changed. The last 200, 220 years changed into that a really a separation of reality from where we should be. And it's affecting a lot of our health, our health care, and systems like that. And I love your book and the science and what you talk about the tools and this connection and what aha moments and what innovations and creativity emerge by doing the practice as you talk about it. I believe it's greater tools and by no means to, to force you in any ways to go beyond what you created this beautiful work for and your examples and the journeys that you take us on in the book. But I I'm always trying to push the boundaries. How can I get great thought leaders like mm -hmm. you and the people you write about in the book to think about how do we really get that transition? How do we make that connection to the future our world needs to go into? And then automatically that environmentalism that we're, when we're connected to nature and the outdoors, I don't think you're out there on your walks and your hikes out there throwing your plastic trash everywhere. Hopefully you're leaving the world better than you found it, the nature better than you found it. And 
you're saying, hey, we need to protect and preserve it. And when I do work, go back to work, I'm going to realize, boy, how much energy and stuff I really got out of being in nature. And I want to preserve that. I want to restore it and regenerate it. And I think that affects also how you are when you're at work. And that's the reasons I bring that up. Do you have anything to say about that? I'm sort of thinking about an experiment now. Before you articulated the sort of four-hour work, where you're four hours of productive work, spending the rest milling around coffee machines and chatting. I wonder if was brave enough to accept that's all you get. If you let someone free to free them from the shackles of that office and let them be in nature, do what they want, would you get eight hours productive work? I think you'd get a lot more, to tell you the truth. Is that actually more productive if you really break all those shackles? And I guess there's companies which are embracing post-COVID the work from anywhere. But you don't That's also that. a big infrastructure. When you think about it, that the post-COVID or even COVID time, they're embracing it. But is it up to speed? I heard stories. People were getting ergonomic issues by working from their kitchen table or their bed or their sofa that they were starting problems. And then companies started to ship computers and better routers so that they could do work from home and chairs to the home. But then people were like all over the world were saying, we don't have broadband as a human right. I don't have enough broadband for my kids and my wife and myself to work from home. I don't have enough rooms, computers. It's freezing cold. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So there's so many things you hear in entrepreneurship and serial entrepreneurs and startups always hear about beach money or this digital nomad, go work from the beach and and go work from anywhere in the world. And and that, and it is possible, but there's also a reality factor of the infrastructure of where and how that work looks like. Most of those people aren't producing food or farming or building computers or writing code for software or, or whatever there is. Those people are creating social media content or writing books or doing different things where that type of a lifestyle is conducive. Generally not managing a family at the same time. Exactly. They're not traveling around with a bunch of kids and a wife and a dog and living on the beach one week and the next in the forest. It's reality set in, but what are those realities of the future? The hardest question I have for you today, I'm going to drop it on you now, if that's okay, unless you wanted to talk a little bit more about my musings of how do we prepare the future. It it ties to that. I want to ask you the burning question, WTF, which is what's the futures, but I want to twist it in, in, in a little bit of a different way. What does a world that works for everyone look like to you? Gosh, what does an easy one, isn't it? What does a world that looks like to everyone work for what everyone? Do, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? How utopian can I go? All right. <laughs> it's up to you. That's the thing. It's not what your job, your family, yeah. it's up to you. What does that look like? I like globalization and I love the European project. I think open borders is a great thing for humanity. And this is parking, whatever economic issues, but that would absolutely be there for me. We should be able to go wherever we want to go and work wherever we want to work. So that's, that would be my utopian, bit of my utopian future. We are, as we talked earlier, we were born out in nature and part of nature. So accepting that from that work life side of things. And maybe it is that sense of, allowing people so not everyone can work wherever they want but i'm opening the borders so people may be able to choose that but maybe they should be allowed much more to work however they want and yes there'll be constraints of people's personal lives and families and whatever else they're dealing with that nine to five 40 hour monday to friday is what's wrong i think your points are going back to even if you go back to the point of the the agricultural revolution people were suddenly more sedentary and working but they still had a rhythm to their life which was driven by nature was driven by what they were growing what they were nurturing what they were planting feeding their families it wasn't we go out in the fields and do the same thing every day and i think that would be what i'd like to see work change to and businesses change to 
and the one of the easiest ways to start to explore that is to embrace natural systems and regenerative regenerative systems because you'll start to realize that works and you'll start to realize that most businesses do to some degree follow that even if they try to inflict the same thing every week and i'm <laughs> worked in young tech really not a fan of the wednesday stand up or the i'm not against meetings at all but it's that absolute rigid this is what we do at the same time every day or week just seems, agile scrum the meetings the yeah just seems nuts nuts to me so maybe those two things open all the borders and allow work to be much more of a natural thing as opposed to a constrained thing I don't know how we do that, Mark. <laughs> when I said earlier, I really do think food and agriculture and animal agriculture domesticated us. It wasn't the other way around that we domesticated it. I think it really made it so that we had to say, stay put and do the harvests and do the planning and do the, do the things. And much more became much more the beginnings of this sedentary type of a lifestyle. And the type of farming we did really also has created a ripple effect. But I love, I love your why, and I'm also in alignment with that. That's a, I've only gotten that answer to the question, what does a world that works for everyone look like? Is open things up without nations and borders and this division of humanity one from another to go around. The, the thing I would like to ask is that the question to what you said is it kind of says not everybody can work anywhere why why is that what job would require or what job is it that somebody couldn't work anywhere i think that any job that you mention no matter how shitty we think it is or how bad of a job it is or how if it's screwing on a screw on a conveyor belt for eight hours a day just the same repetitive thing However boring or the boardroom, you have that section in your book about the boardroom, like the boring company, it's a boring type of a situation most of the time. That can be done anywhere in the world. And the interesting thing is before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, local economies, local practices and production and manufacturing were the key. There was a lot more small hold Farmers and producers and manufacturers on a small scale, leather goods, food products, whatever you could think of that build these little local economies and they disappeared to the big cities. They disappeared to big industrial areas. And now those people who the younger generations that we also talked about in our call, they left their small town cities and that to go where bigger opportunities are, right? And when they did, all those local manufacturing production left as well. And so now a lot of people get the imports from other places, the large areas. And actually, you could take your bakery, your leather production, what, whatever you want to do or produce or manufacturing to pretty much any area or island of this world and just start your own business or start your own local economy to contribute to other beautiful locations of the world, mm -hmm. Bali and Fiji or your dream is Alaska, Iceland, Greenland, who knows? Yeah, that's the dream. And, and then you've created a lifestyle. You're creating your own economy and saying, yeah. well, not only am I making and producing and doing this somewhere else that may, I'm always wondering the big migration we've seen over the decades where there's some people from beautiful places of the world that are coming to cold Germany or to cold places of Europe. They live in a, what I would consider a paradise, but they're leaving because the social infrastructure, the healthcare, the pay is not as good, but they just left that paradise to work for the almighty dollar. Why couldn't they create their own economy, their own production, what they want there in a flourishing lifestyle connected to that nature where they are? Because usually after they've made that almighty buck or that wisdom creeps in, they tend to want to return back to that home spot anywhere, that beautiful place that they were at. I'm a huge fan of Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, and he had a huge writer's block in his life and it was run, he was writing the adventures of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. And he just had this writer's block. He couldn't do it. And I'm in Hamburg, Germany. 
and have lived in Germany for a long time. My mother was German in that. And I heard the story because I attended, I went to Heidelberg University as a graduate there, that Samuel Clemens was there with his priest or preacher doing his tour to raise money because he had money problems a lot. So he would lecture and talk and do things as well. So he was in Heidelberg and um, during the day, he and his priest friend, they would row up and down the river there in Heidelberg and visit the different castles up and along the river. And that activity of rowing and going up and walking through the nature into these castles and what in Germany they call burgs or big fortresses and things that they have a lot of in Europe, broke that writer's block that he had and when he writes about the Mississippi and being on the river and that and the big steamboat captain, it, had, it was triggered by this creativity of being in Germany, total different language, beer, food, and they experienced that at that time in a total different place than the Mississippi River. <laughs> as well that he writes this this but it but that well, there's many reports in his autobiography and that it was actually germany that in a different location that broke that writer's block and that we've talked about globalization and nature and this connectivity it's just some creative things that you would say wow that how in the hell did that happen you know total different place the best novel american novelist you'd ever see in stories most successful and it was all solved in a total different country, total different language. Looking at castles on, on I believe it's the Neckar or the Rhine River. I can't even remember what rivers they are that he rode up and down. It's unbelievable. But you also have that experience in the stories in your book as well on, on similar things with Legos and other things. I'd like to, you, you've reached into this creativity aspect as well. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't put Mark Twain in the book, but actually I did, did read about him a bit in, in researching it. And he's not alone. There's a fantastic actual another book by Frederick Gross called The Philosophy of Walking, which delves into a lot of thinkers and, and writers. And I talk about Nietzsche quite a lot in the book, who, who had very similar experiences, whether they were blocked or whether it was just when they were engaging in nature and walking and doing other things outside where their finest work came from. So you know, I think that speaks to that you that deep evolutionary physiological bit that no doubt things spark in your brain and connections are made and new ideas happen in that happy mix of look, walking's a way to do it, but being in nature and being slightly distracted and doing something not too taxing but not totally relaxing is a magic place from a scientific point of view. So I think I can totally understand why that happened. So I delve into some of those stories and my not so profound stories of, of walks I've done and that have had a profound effect on me. And as there's a couple in the book, some of them are to do with challenge, some of them to do with sensory perception. I tell the story of one where I couldn't see more than about 10 meters all day in the Welsh mountains. And it was like being in a sensory deprivation tank and it was an amazing experience. I'm quite a fan of mixing the outdoors with uh, sometimes challenge but i think what's more important is new places and there's a real powerful thing about being a different culture so i lead a lot of trips and i take a lot of people to morocco simply because i think there's another bit about being out of your cultural zone so i find that interesting but it can be as simple as getting lost going somewhere totally new i've got a great friend in in norway torrell in the book who purposely gets lost and, and talks about the benefits of that and your sort of cult, yeah, your sort of inbuilt GPS is suddenly clicking like crazy. And that's part of that. Neurologist Shane O'Mara talks about it, just a, a luck of evolution that the same bit of our brains that are to do with imagination are also our internal GPS. Just the same neurons firing when you're trying to navigate somewhere new that also are a key to imagination. So there's a lot in there. But I think what that also leads me, and I talk quite a lot in the book, is that I think there's a myth that creativity is just thinking. And yes, it's almost the opposite, I think, that doing these things, your thoughts happen, but despite you, it's not sitting down to think. But actually, 
creativity is much more powerful if it involves acts of play of making art whatever that might form that might take that adds to it I have a number of techniques I do with teams and that play on that and the one that really works well and I can show you some amazing videos from this from teams I've been with where I on the first part of the walk I get them all to just find an item it, it, it doesn't I don't give them any rules they just have to find a natural item on their walk so you end up with leaves and twigs and moss and all sorts of flowers and then at some point in the walk i get them into teams and they have to it depends on what the performance but let's say you have to tell a story about someone on your team or your company using these items and it's one of the things which gets the best makes for good videos because normally some of them someone in there's quite amusing and does something amusing but actually some of the some quite deep insights come out of that and I think that's something to do with things happening but through a different sort of medium and the classic one which again I quote in the book is Lego and I say that I think the best innovators are conceptually people who never stopped playing Lego with their friends doesn't mean they have to be doing Lego now but there's it's that concept of sitting down with something without an idea of what you're gonna what the outcome's gonna be with other people is a really powerful way to think about creativity but you can use twigs and leaves and doesn't matter rocks. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that as well. I was in, in Copenhagen on this youth island and we had a bunch of twigs, moss, leaves, flowers, and we had to build this ecological city of the future just out of the 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 uh, materials presented it and the amazing creativity and the things that people come up with. We were having these these plants create energy and stuff, and just these processes that could thrive out of that is just a, it's astounding. Um, I only have two more questions for you, and then we're done. I really appreciate you diving deep into not only just thinking outdoors and creativity and touching on parts of your book. I the intent of our discussion was never to read or give away the entire book. We want to encourage people to go out there and read it and see how it applies to their to their lives. And if they also have the aha moments that I did, which led to maybe total, totally different questions that you hadn't thought before or heard before on how can we get to those futures? Because I'm totally with you on the outdoors and thinking outdoors and i'm an environmentalist and I love walking in nature and do, encapsulating and building those things into my daily life and routine creating a lifestyle out of that instead of me conforming which i'm not a big conformist into a lifestyle to be a robot or mechanic or work in some kind of environment that i wouldn't enjoy and i would encourage and empower others to do that same factor and that leads me to, to the last two questions so i really appreciate that if there was one message or maybe even two messages that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their lives, what would it be? What's your message? Well, could I come up with something pithy now? Uh, <laughs> I have used this one before. It, it sounds a bit jokey, but I think there's something in it, which is that bunking off is the deepest work you can do. Okay, now I'm not from the United Kingdom. Bunking off, you got to oh. explain towards me. Oh, bunking off, working. Just the deepest uh, yeah. work you can do. Dr drifting or just you know, bunking off. Okay, that's a good one. I hadn't yeah. heard that one before. <laughs> I love it. I And I think that's, that's true. When you get out of your head or what the moment is, that's when these moments of creativity really come. I love that. That's a fabulous piece of advice. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far, anthropology to technology to professor to entrepreneurship that you would have loved to know from the start? You've had quite the journey. You're still on it. What would you have liked to, Ooh, that's to know from the start? What would I have liked to have known from the start? I don't know. I sometimes ask, you know, it's not my question, but with walking, I ask people sometimes if they want to meet their 18-year-old self or their 80-year-old self. 
as a related sort of question, isn't it? What would I want to claim from my professional my professional life from the start? So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a while to answer this. You'll have to edit this, Mark. I, yeah. I ask this to a lot of people, and most people say nothing because I really like the journey. The journey has taught me a lot. Yeah. The other thing that I hear a lot in the way I answer. This is, I wish I would have learned it sooner. I wish I would have started sooner. If I would have known all this, what I know now, I would have started much sooner. But yeah. it, 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 this journey has been a development of discovery and learning things. Right. Some people yeah. wouldn't change anything. Those are just maybe spark yeah. how you would answer that question. Yeah, definitely. I've enjoyed the whole journey. And it's, it is easy to think that I wish I would have been doing what I'm doing now earlier, but I probably couldn't have. It's all cumulative and lego bricks yeah the my my building now is a part of all of those not that i did this much i struck out self-employed in my late 20s so i didn't work for the man if you like for much of my life what would i have done maybe some of the especially that's bits before and maybe things since i think i could probably could have even been braver and if you're not if it's not working for you whether that's the company the job whatever get out sooner there's there's always something else you can do so and i think to your point you mentioned earlier that's thinking the trap is my pay packet or my and those things are important but yeah, oh yeah there's a times where i could have been braver and said this isn't working just walk out the door it's not, not, not going to be the end and maybe that would have led me somewhere different but no i think yeah the journeys wish i had more time up. i'd quite like to have I have dreams, like everyone has dreams. I'd have quite liked to have been a professor of archaeology and just done that my whole life, but I probably wouldn't have in, when it came to the reality of doing it day in, day, month in, month out. Yeah, that, I can see that as well. A lot of my younger life, I spent tons of time outside. I think that it, it's not an easy transition. I told you that I've been standing for over 28 years now, but I had it easy. I did a lot of farming and I had a lot of family businesses that were outside and things that I did that were involved in that. So the transition was a lot easier, but I know other people that I've seen in working situations there um, start with health problems, headaches, or, or whatever it is. And to make that transition, it's not something that happens from one moment to the next it, everybody's different and takes time to to make that transition and so i know some people that made it from sitting to standing in three weeks and others made it in a week and others made it in a year so it's um where they kind of have to train themselves and it's just everybody's different but yeah change is good if it wasn't we would still be wearing those stinky diapers that we were right after our birth it would be a, sh a shitty outlook but change is a positive thing and we all have that power to do that we should be empowered to create our own local uh futures however we want it and the quicker we realize that i think that we unlock the things that you talk about in your book so Gary, I really appreciate you sharing the creativity factor with me and uh, speaking to you. Thank you for sharing and letting us all inside of your ideas. Wow. And I've pushed the boundaries with you. So I've really tried to get your ideas to come out. So I love that you have says, I think this and I would do this and my personal experience, because that's what I want to hear. I want to hear about the journey that you made so far. And, and I thank you for lending us all inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. And that's all I have, unless you have anything else to add. No, it's been an absolute pleasure, Mark. And everyone's different in all their ways of working and thinking. When I put that to my book, there also is an audio book. Where, you know, I, it's not me speaking. It's a nice professional voice actor. Apparently, he's got a very soothing voice. It's good to take on a walk, maybe. But just a question for you then, Mark, because I've asked... I did a survey in my book of asking people, where do you have your best ideas, if you had to answer it? My best ideas are always outside, absolutely. And I, I'm more of a mountain person, so I like mountains and forests as well. But I really, it's not talking above 3,000 meters, but I'm talking above 2,000. So I like that too. That's a top of the world feeling. And, yeah. and that... Well, yeah. Very much me as well. Although, yeah, some people... Can't get out them or find intimidating, but yes, I'm always drawn to mountains. Other thing, lots, really... lots of mountain mountain adventures this year to come. 
Yeah, I hope so. I hope you have tons of them. I really also like working on the farm. I like getting my hands dirty and soil underneath my fingertips and being grounded um, to growing food. I think that growing food is like printing your own money. And I just, a good friend of mine, the gangster gardener, Ron Finley said that. And I just think it's so true. If we create our own things and do the toils of our own hands, we can create our own economies and really have beautiful futures. It's been a sheer pleasure. Thank you so much, Gary. Have a wonderful day. And I'm excited to release this podcast. Thanks, Mark. 